Well, thank you everybody and welcome to session number three. My name is Ben Jealous and I'm a barrister at the Victorian Bar. It's my very great pleasure to introduce and chair this session which is titled The Murphy Papers. The title refers to Justice Lionel Murphy who was, as we all know, Attorney General in the Whitlam Government and then appointed as a Justice of the High Court in 1975. In circumstances that you will shortly hear about, while a High Court Justice, he faced two criminal trials and was convicted and then acquitted of attempting to pervert the course of justice. Following his acquittal, Justice Murphy moved to resume sitting as a member of the High Court. This was controversial and the Hawke government appointed a commission of inquiry to determine whether, in broad terms, Justice Murphy's past conduct was such as to make him no longer a fit and proper person to be a Justice of the High Court. In about May 1986, this commission commenced its work. In July 1986, Justice Murphy was diagnosed with terminal cancer. The commission was terminated and never completed its work. Justice Murphy died later that year, having returned to the High Court of Australia to sit for one final week. The work of the Commission was then made confidential by the Hawke Government under threat of criminal punishment for a period of 30 years, perhaps in the expectation that the, work, that the information would never indeed ultimately be disclosed. 30 years have passed since that decision and the documents of the Commission, the Murphy Papers that are the subject of this session, have now been released. These documents promise to shed some light on unresolved questions from this very interesting period in Australian history. They provoke questions about the institutional response to the Murphy affair and they perhaps include some pointers for the future in dealing with issues of probity and public life. We are blessed today to have with us the two people who are perhaps across Australia best placed to look back on these times. First, Professor Nicholas Cowdery, AM, QC, former DPP of New South Wales and junior counsel at the two criminal trials. Junior counsel to the now president of this society, um, Mr Ian Callanan. Second, the Honourable Stephen Charles AOQC, who in 1986 was a preeminent silk at the Victorian Bar and was appointed as counsel assisting the commission in its then secret work. Later, he was to serve as an eminent and respected judge of the Court of Appeal of the Supreme Court Victoria for more than a decade. To get the session started, can you please now join with me in welcoming Mr Cowdery. Well, thanks very much, Ben, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak to you this afternoon about the Murphy Trials. Uh, and as you've heard, my role is to set the scene, to describe uh, something of how those proceedings took place, uh, to tell the story, I guess, uh, of what happened and what then led on to the Parliamentary Commission of Inquiry, which Stephen will talk about when I have concluded mine. Um, this uh, was a... a series of events back in really starting in about 1982 and going through to 1986 uh, which was a very turbulent time in the law in Australia but certainly in New South Wales where the criminal proceedings took place. Uh, Justice Virginia Bell of the High Court has described these as sensational events, uh, a prosecution that occasioned deep divisions within the legal community. She said, everything about this saga was extraordinary, and I can certainly vouch for that. Uh, she described it as perhaps the most tumultuous period in the administration of justice in New South Wales. Well, in the middle of that tumult, I was just a humble junior barrister who had been doing quite a bit of prosecuting for the Commonwealth for some time after uh, a spell for a few years as a public defender in Papua New Guinea in crime. Or I should say in criminal law practice, not in crime in Papua New Guinea. <laughs> <coughs> uh, 
I, I had plenty of clients who <laughs> filled the other description. I was a public defender there for four and a half years. But back at the Sydney Bar, uh, I had some experience prosecuting uh, Commonwealth matters and no doubt uh, it was that which led to my being briefed as junior counsel in these proceedings, junior to Ian Callanan, whom I saw before, down, hiding down the back. Now, he's, he's ready to pounce as soon as I get something wrong. <laughs> Although he claims that because he's older than I am, his memory is not as good as mine. <laughs> Sorry, Ian, mine's a shot as well. Um, but um, for those of you, that, and I'm sure there are some in the room who weren't born then, uh, or at least who were not paying particular attention to public affairs in those days, um, just uh, a little bit of background. You've heard in the introduction just the, the thumbnail sketch. Um, the story behind these events needs to be explained a little bit so that you understand what was happening and who was involved. There was a very well-known solicitor in Sydney by the name of Morgan Ryan. And he was a very close friend of Lionel Murphy. They'd been friends since the 1950s. And Morgan Ryan had been charged with two indictable Commonwealth offences of forgery and conspiracy to commit a Commonwealth offence in relation to immigration matters. He acted for people seeking to enter into Australia uh, as immigrants. And uh, it was alleged that with those proceedings pending and the committal proceedings still to take place in what is now the local court in New South Wales, the Magistrates Court, um, and later after Ryan was committed for trial and before the trial took place in the district court, that Murphy, uh, in speaking about the Ryan case to the New South Wales Chief Magistrate, Clarence Breeze, uh, at a dinner party at Breeze's house, uh, and later had attempted to have some influence brought to bear on the committing magistrate, Kevin Jones. And it was alleged that in a later telephone call to Breeze, Murphy had uttered the now famous words, and now, what about my little mate? <laughs> As I said, famous words. Uh, after Ryan had been committed for trial on the conspiracy charge alone, so the forgery charge was not committed for trial, it was alleged that Murphy at a dinner party at his home had sought to bring similar influence directly to bear on District Court Judge Paul Flannery, who was to hear the Ryan trial. Uh, and. Um, those are the events that are the subject of the criminal charges that were proceeded with. To finish the Ryan story, Ryan was in fact convicted uh, of conspiracy to commit a criminal, uh, Commonwealth offence, and he was sentenced to a bond for five years and fined $400. He appealed against his conviction, and the Court of Criminal Appeal actually overturned the conviction on the ground that Flannery had admitted inadmissible evidence. Um, so that was the end of the proceedings against Ryan. But it's the intervention of Murphy at the two stages of the, he of the proceedings against Ryan uh, that formed the subject of the prosecution. Now, a very quick run through the proceedings so that you get the sort of general framework in which we're talking. Um, there were committal proceedings in the local court, I think it was still called the Court of Petty Sessions in those days. I've just forgotten exactly when the name changed. Uh, but in any event, Murphy was committed for trial on the two charges that have been brought against him. Uh, one charge, to give it very briefly, because they're quite long in their, in their entirety, um, was that between dates in December 1981 and January 1982, 
uh, Murphy did attempt to pervert the course of justice in relation to the judicial power of the Commonwealth in that he did attempt to influence Clarence Breeze to um, uh, cause Kevin Jones, the magistrate, to act otherwise than in accordance with his duty. So that was the first charge in relation to that. So that's the Breeze charge in relation to the committal proceedings. The second charge was the Flannery charge in relation to the trial. And it was that between dates in July 1983, um, he uh, attempted to pervert the course of justice in relation to the judicial power of the Commonwealth, in that he did attempt to cause Flannery uh, to act otherwise than in accordance with his duty with respect to the trial. So those were the two charges, and he was committed for trial on both of those charges. He um, instituted a legal review of the committal. In those days, you could bring proceedings under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act, a Commonwealth Act. You can't do it for committal proceedings anymore, uh, in fact, not for many years. But in those days, you could. So uh, because these were Commonwealth matters, that review was taken to the federal court uh, and was dismissed. It was unsuccessful. Uh, the first trial then took place. Uh, before the end, or at the end of the Crown case in the first trial, Murphy gave notice that he would seek to reserve certain legal points uh, for review by the High Court. So, at the first trial, he was convicted of the... I always get these mixed up. He was, he was convicted of one and acquitted of the other. And um, the Breeze charge uh, sustained the conviction, the Flannery charge, the acquittal. So he, two, two review sets of review proceedings happened. One was the questions of law that he had reserved during the trial, and that was heard in the High Court and his applications were dismissed. There was then an appeal to the combined Court of Appeal and Court of Criminal Appeal of New South Wales, reviewing, first of all, in the Court of Appeal, certain questions of law that had been um, uh, reserved as well, and then, with the same bench constituted by five judges, uh, the Court of Criminal Appeal uh, reviewed his conviction, and it overturned the conviction and ordered a new trial. Essentially, the criticisms were directed towards the trial judges' directions to the jury, uh, and there was concern by the Court of Criminal Appeal uh, about the possibility of a miscarriage of justice, but a new trial was ordered. There was then a delay uh, of a few months because various people, including then Premier of New South Wales, Neville Rann, had made a number of public statements about what had happened uh, along the way. So time was allowed by the Commonwealth DPP for any prejudicial effect of that publicity to abate before the second trial took place. In the second trial, uh, Murphy was acquitted of the Breeze charge. So at the end of the proceedings, there were no convictions against him. Uh, and it was shortly after the end of the second trial that we became aware, that's the prosecution team became aware for the first time that he was suffering from advanced uh, cancer and that his prospects were pretty grim. Uh, and then you've heard subsequently in 1986, the Parliamentary Commission of Inquiry was set up and I'll leave Stephen to talk about that. So that's the, the um, outline uh, of what happened. Um, there is a paper that I've prepared for you and you'll have access to it, I gather, uh, after the conference. It's quite long. Um, it, it's uh, 16 pages. 
and it includes uh, some uh, excerpts from transcripts and, and some of the uh, detail of the proceedings uh, as they took place. Uh, I invite you to read the paper. You'll get a lot more from the paper than you will from me in the next uh, 15 minutes. Uh, but there are some things in there that I hope you would find of interest uh, and um, raise questions about, perhaps about um, uh, how matters might be dealt with in the future. The paper that I've given you um, is drawn largely from an article that was published in the Queensland University Law Review in 2008 when I was asked to write about the Murphy proceedings um, focusing on Ian, Ian Callanan. Uh, and uh, so you'll find that there are some comments about Ian woven into the paper here and there. Uh, I just want to make a couple of comments about Ian and I, I hope uh, this is in order. Too bad if it's not, he's right down the back and I can't hear him. <laughs> but those of you who, who, and I guess all of you know Ian, um, and some of you very well I guess, um, you, this might resonate with you. Um, the late Sir Alec Guinness was fond of saying that he knew that he had the character of a part that he was required to play right when he had the walk right. And if you watch the way, I don't know whether he still does, I'm talking about 30 years ago, but Ian's walk gives you some indication, I think, of his character. It appeared to me, I mean, Ian uh, is a large man, and I think he was larger in those days but his walk is sort of deceptively hesitant. It's, it's an almost delicate step. And it gives you a little bit of an insight into the way in which he conducts his professional practice. Um, he is relentless in his pursuits, but he's always polite. He uses genteel words, tones, expressions. He's very solicitous. He doesn't make a noise or fuss. And even at times there's a sort of air of distraction or apology for what he's doing. Because what he's doing is very strong. And he seems to use strong words almost regretfully, as if acknowledging their force but wanting to hold that back in his mouth. It's a, it's a very interesting... I mean, I was with him for a long time. I had the opportunity to see and to hear all of this. Uh, but I hope some of it resonates with you. Um, I'm sure he has very strong feelings about a lot of things. It's exceedingly rare to hear him swear. Exceedingly rare. And he remembers. His memory is very good. So that kind of approach was brought in these proceedings to, um, to the addresses that were made, to the cross-examination that was made, uh, and so on. So let me just take you to a few of those excerpts from the record to show um, a little bit about Ian, but also a little bit about Murphy. When Murphy was committed for trial, he said this, Your Worship, I am completely innocent. I am angry at these false charges. I did not attempt to pervert the course of justice. However, should the case go to a jury, I will present my account of the facts in evidence to the jury. I will dispute the versions given by the main witnesses for the prosecution. So that was his declaration at the time of being committed for trial to the Supreme Court. Um, Ian's advocacy style, um, in response to what Murphy said, and which I've just read out to you, he said this. Sorry, there, there was... Mur Murphy had said those words that I've given to you, that also been the address by his counsel, uh, arguing that he should not be committed for trial because there was not sufficient evidence for there to be a reasonable prospect of conviction in court at trial. And Ian's response to that was, could we say this first? That despite all the protestations to the contrary by my learned friend, 
His submissions, and this is on the second leg of the committal test, amounted to no more than a rehearsing of the old argument on the first leg of the test, and there'd been submissions about that earlier. <laughs> now, to that extent, we don't deem it, deem it necessary to descend into the same detail with respect to facts as does our learned friend. We'd also submit to your worship that you've really been invited, although again the protestations are to the contrary, to retract your findings. But, to show a little bit of the steel there, he also made references, this is Ian in his submissions, to the utter bankruptcy of the defence and ludicrous examples employed by the defence such as have been able to be pointed to are really, with the greatest of respect, quite ridiculous. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it just gives you a, a, a little bit of an idea. Um, in the first trial, Murphy gave evidence. And in cross-examination, um, Ian uh, tackled the meeting that occurred between Murphy and Judge Flannery at, the, at a function at Milano's restaurant here in Brisbane, where their paths crossed. And uh, Ian asked uh, Murphy this in cross-examination. And I don't say this in any critical way, I don't suggest this, but you had quite a lot to drink that night. <laughs> and Murphy said, yes, let me say this, Mr. Callanan. We were certainly not inebriated, if that is what you were suggesting. And, of course, the famous phrase, now, what about my little mate? This gives you some indication of the, the uh, doggedness of, of Callan and QC. Uh, this is a passage of cross, short passage of cross-examination of Murphy. Do you say categorically that you did not use the words, my little mate? Answer, yes. Has that always been your recollection? Yes. Quite categorically, you did not use those words. Yes. Emphatically, you did not use the words, my little mate. Yes. Your recollection on that has never wavered? No. Do you deny that you never used those words? There are a couple of negatives there, but Murphy picked up on that and said, I deny that I did use those words. Do you deny that you did use those words on that occasion? Yes. So we've got a pretty clear picture that Murphy was not admitting that he'd used the words. <laughs> but of course, um, a lot did turn on the use of those words and in the context in which they were used and the person to whom they were used. And Clary Breeze was adamant that Murphy had said those words to him. And Clary Breeze, even by Murphy's admission, uh, was, is, an honourable, forthright, God-fearing, law-abiding chief magistrate at the time. So, there was a clear clash. Um, there were other witnesses who were called in the defence case, and one of them was Justice Michael Kirby, who was at that time President of the New South Wales Court of Appeal. Uh, and he um, was cross-examined uh, by Ian about his appointment to his first judicial appointment at a very young age. But as it turned out, it was not Murphy who appointed him, it was the uh, Minister for Labour who had made the recommendation to the Executive Council. Uh, when he retired, um, Ian said that Kirby, by then a fellow member of the High Court, as you will know, uh, reminded him of that experience of being cross-examined in the Murphy trial. And Ian said he reminded him still in a very pleasant way. He's a very genial man and we laugh about it. It wasn't such a genial event at the time that it happened. But uh, one piece of useful information did come from um, Kirby 
and that was that he uh, put on record that he regarded loyalty by Murphy to his friends as one of his qualities. As I said, Murphy, of course, tried to downplay the connection that he had with Morgan Ryan, but it was quite clear that they had been very close friends for decades. The other thing perhaps I might mention um, uh, is the involvement of the jury in these proceedings because it, it was quite unusual. Um, the night that Murphy was convicted in the first trial, and the verdict came in at about 9.30 at night, and the courtroom was absolutely packed. Uh, it included a number of people in dinner suits who had come along Phillip Street from the annual bench and bar dinner which was being held that night in the subterranean dining room of the Bar Association uh, who had got word that the jury was coming back and so they traipsed down the road to see what happened. It also included in the upper gallery uh, then New South Wales Solicitor General Mary Gordon, who of course went on to become a High Court Justice. Uh, and the Murphy family, who were in very buoyant spirits, expecting acquittals and planning uh, a celebration party at Murphy's residence after the event. Uh, when the first verdict came in, or it went, no, the, the first verdict was on the Breeze one, which was, was guilty, and then the second verdict was on the Flannery charge, which was not guilty. So the party celebrations um, for the Murphy group um, fell apart, uh, but back at the bench and bar dinner, uh, Roddy Marr QC, who subsequently went on to be a Supreme Court judge, shouted champagne for his table. <laughs> uh, now, there was a lot of public comment about the result, as you might imagine, and some of it was, was uh, misguided and misdirected. But on the 11th of July, the, the verdict came in on the, 4th of, uh, on the um, 5th of July, Friday the 5th. Uh, on the 11th of July, so a week later, um, or nearly a week later, uh, a man identifying himself as the foreman of the jury telephoned John Laws on his widely broadcast radio program. And he said he was speaking for a few of the jurors. And he said this, I don't think anybody who has commented has any idea of the month out of our life. The anguish, the heartache, and the misery we went through to do what was required of us. We all agree we were looking at a good man who answered a call for help. And he referred to comments that the jury had got it wrong and said, that's very hard on the jury. And he urged people to be quiet about the matter until the appeal was heard, because it was known that there would be an appeal. A letter had come the day before from someone purporting to be a juror, and that letter was sent to Murphy's solicitors. And this person, said that most of the jury believed Murphy to be not guilty of attempting to influence judicial officers or of trying to gain an advantage for Ryan. It was said in the letter that after the judge's directions on the possibility of risk, they had no option but to convict. And in the letter, uh, Alex Shand QC, who was leading counsel for Murphy in the first trial, was criticised for not making any loophole clear in his final address. But it also said that Callanan shouldn't gloat. He did not convince us. And Peter Bowers, writing in the Sydney Morning Herald at the same time, said, how richly, peculiarly Australian for a justice of the High Court of Australia to get into so much strife over the phrase, and now, what about my little mate? So um, I think the only thing that I'll mention, you, you will have the paper, and as I say, there's a lot of detailed information provided in there. But the, I guess, 
um, one of the things that stands out for me from the whole proceedings is that Murphy said at the end of the committal proceedings that he would give evidence and explain himself. In the first trial, he did give evidence. He went into the witness box and he was cross-examined. And he was acquitted of one and convicted of the other. At the second trial, and I don't want to steal Stephen's thunder because I think he'll refer to this, Murphy did not give evidence. He made an unsworn statement from the dock. And I think that was disgraceful. I, I think is probably the best word to use. That a high court justice in criminal proceedings against him would take a course which was available really for people who were uneducated or vulnerable or uh, uh, in some way incapable of standing up to the rigours of cross-examination, especially having gone through it once. Uh, and um, in, in fact, when uh, Ian and I were discussing whether or not Murphy would give evidence in the second trial because we did have some more information by that stage which was available to attack his credit, his, his character, if that opportunity arose. Uh, Ian, very promptly, when we were talking about it, uh, I think during the early part of the second trial, said he won't go into evidence, he'll make a doc statement. I said, what? How could you possibly say that? Anyway, the, the short story is that I bet him. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you, you can't do that. I'll, I'll bet you he gives evidence. And Ian said, all right, how much do you want to bet? So I, being a, a, an inveterate gambler, I said a dollar. <laughs> and so the bet uh, was made and, of course, lost by me as soon as Murphy started his doc statement. And so what I did afterwards, uh, sometime afterwards, was to have a dollar mounted as a trophy on a little stand, suitably inscribed, which we call the Flannery Memorial Dollar. <laughs> In honour of the late Judge Paul Flannery, who's agonised over the evidence that he gave in the first trial, which included the Flannery charge. And if you ever want to see how literally and particularly somebody may take the oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, read Paul Flannery's transcript. It was excruciating. And it left a, a deep impact on all of us. Uh, so the Flannery Memorial Dollar, the last time I saw it, it was sitting on a shelf in Ian's chambers in the High Court in Canberra. I don't know where it's got to these days, probably in a box somewhere. But it's a, it's a relic of those times and, and uh, something that uh, is fondly remembered. Uh, so um, that's, that's, I think, all that I need to say. Um, uh, they were extraordinary times. The quotes that I've given you from Virginia Bell uh, come from the, the foreword of a book written about the matter. Uh, when the trial ended, uh, Ian said, you know, somebody should write a book about this. And I naturally thought that he would be the one to do so. But he went off and wrote some potboiler novels and some plays and some, <laughs> some high, high court judgments and things like that. I never got round to the book, uh, but Judge Stephen Wormsley of the District Court of New South Wales, uh, who is the partner of Paul Flannery's daughter, who is also a judge, uh, wrote The Trials of Justice Murphy, which was published last year, uh, and uh, Justice Virginia Bell wrote the foreword to it, which included those words that I quoted at the beginning. Uh, so you can rush out and buy this if you like. Uh, it's published by LexisNexis Butterworths. Uh, it's not an easy read. Um, it's very detailed. It's very accurate. It's very complete. Uh, it's a hard slog. 
but it will give you the facts, it will give you all the information you will ever need to know about the trials of Justice Murphy. So, thank you very much. Thank you.